VBS that's coming up, so it's something to, to keep in mind, uh, keep in your prayers and whatnot. Uh, it's going to be June uh, 22nd? 23rd. Okay. Starting June 23rd, which is a Sunday, going to Thursday. So invite people. Should be good. We're working on some things, so it should be it should be a good, good week. Um, also, Sunday, June 16th is the, uh, a special service for the baby dedication of the, the three families with, the, with little babies, the Marts, the Kijaks, and the Petersheim. So look forward to that on June 16th. Is that everything? I think that's all we have. All right, we'll continue singing. Oh, we all stand? <clears throat>
try to have that way, but children's church, you're dismissed for that. What? <laughs> Alright, prayer and praise time. Just that first song we sang, Going to See the King. I see Joe's not here this morning, so we uh, took, took his place with the song, I guess. But we're going to go to see the King. He, uh, Jesus is coming back. And then I just think about the next song, that Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Um, or it, that, That's a verse, I guess, but the song, that was the gist of the, the song. Uh, I think Alvin mentioned that last Sunday about us speaking forth the word of God or speaking um, things and I um, I know I talked about in in that song it said about singing God's promises and uh, it reminded me of um, God's promises I um, had I think we all would say there's a lot of promises in the Bible I am I remember right it's, it's that the one where there's 632, or that was the laws of the Old Testament? I don't know. I, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But we said there's a lot of promises, but I was reminded of a verse in, in um, 2 Corinthians, uh, verse 1, uh, 20, and it says, For no matter how many promises God has made, so God's made a lot of promises, we said, but do you know that you can count on because it goes on to say they are yes in Christ. Because of Jesus, those promises uh, apply to us and they're yes in him. And then, and then it says, and so through him, through Jesus, the amen, which I think we sometimes say amen is, we say so be it, let it be. But it says through him, the amen is spoken by us. Spoken, it doesn't say it's spoken by God. It's spoken. It's so let it be is spoken by us. That, and we, we, so we sing of God's promises. We speak of His promises, uh, and we do that. It ends by saying it's spoken by us to the glory of God. And so we bring glory to God when we speak of His promises. When we realize they're yes, we claim them for ourselves. And uh, so this is prayer and praise time. Uh, do you have any any praises, any promises of God that you want to share and speak forth? Or also, uh, you can give us your prayer requests too. Uh, and so, go ahead, Michelle.
if you'd like to join me, I'm reading from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 51. And um, Lance and I have been watching The Chosen, and uh, they have different portrayals of the disciples. And Matthew is quite an interesting character in wanting to be so exact in how he puts Jesus' words down. So as we read, as I read this to you, um, this is written by the Holy Spirit, but with the character of Matthew within its pages, starting at 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave when his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to bear his fellow slaves and beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Quiz time. Seven years ago, right here, in this pulpit, I made a prediction. And I actually told you when I believed the Lord was coming back. And um, some of you might remember that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I made the prediction and it, it, it came true. I know when the Lord's going to return. Would you like to know? Let me tell you. Now. I'm going to repeat that. Now. There's a lot of prophecies and a lot of, a lot of prophets out there over the years that have given all kinds of information. But as I read this scripture, it, it, it makes my heart pulse and beat faster. Um, some of you might have gone to the Ben Franklin Museum in a time in your life down in Philadelphia. And you can walk through a heart down there. It used to be. I don't know if it's still there. But as you get inside the heart, and you can see the chambers and everything, you feel the beating. It just kind of, however they have it worked up, it just the, the, and no matter where you stand, it's just that constant. As I read this scripture, I feel the heartbeat of God. I feel him pushing and beating and saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. And I want to portray, if I can, through this scripture this morning, that he comes now. And the whole key to that is that we live ready for his return. Oh, I could give you dates and times and tell you about this with Israel or this with the United States or this with another kingdom or this leader. But if you live <laughs> on the edge... Of being ready. You ever sat outside or on your porch during the lightning storm and you can see the clouds and you can see everything there and you're waiting for the lightning? You probably have been, I have, and you, and you look and you look and you look and you know it's going to happen. 
So you just kind of wait for that bolt of lightning just to come smashing down. That's what I picture in my mind. Waiting. Waiting for the Lord to return. As many of you know, I was supposed to go on a cruise and speak uh, on a cruise down through the Caribbean or somewhere, wherever it was. But um, one of the things that I was going to share was part of this Matthew passage because I wanted everybody to know to be ready. And one of the things that happens, maybe you've been on a cruise or you've been on a big boat, they take the time to show you the lifeboats. They call you up and they have everybody stand by one of the lifeboats and you put on the life vest and they tell you how it's going to go and drop over the edge and all this kind of stuff. And you watch the people and they're really not paying very much attention most of the time. But you always see one or two who are just, okay, I got it, I got it, I know, I know. That's the whole picture of this scripture this morning. That... The return of Christ, his kingdom coming to get us, is so precious and it's so important that we got to live on the edge. Nothing in this world even comes close to comparing to it. His return could be now. I grew up with, in the 60s and 70s, when, oh, there was all kinds of prophetic things. Um, books that came out, A Guide to Survival, and The Late Great Planet Earth. And then, you know, you move on, and each, just about every generation, something comes up about it. And some of it's good, some of it's not. But one thing those books, those speakers, those talks should do is push us to be ready, to watch for the lightning, to watch for the return of Christ. So, looking at the scripture, how do you get ready? How do you be watchful? How do you be observing? How do you wait? How do you, what do you do? Well, one of the keys to this whole message came to me as I was looking at it. It's be ready. Not get ready. It's not something that I can give you 10 steps to be ready. It's not how you get ready. It's living in a state of be ready. The excitement in our hearts should be there. It should be something that moves us. And we're going to look at some of that being ready. Um, about 10 or 12 times in Scripture, there's the use of that word be ready or... Um, be aware or, you know, just focusing in. One of them is in um, the Old Testament in Exodus 19. When Moses goes up to the Mount Sinai, he tells, God tells Moses, be ready, I'm about to speak. Now he walks up that uh, a mountain, and uh, if you've ever seen pictures of it, it's a climb and a half. And he gets all the way up there, and the and the pulse is there. Be ready. I'm about to speak. It's in Exodus 19. It says, and let them be ready. And then there's another story in Joshua. One of the great battles of the Old Testament. And God tells Joshua, listen to this in Joshua chapter 8. Joshua rose with all the people of war to go up against Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 men, valiant warriors, and sent them out at night. And he commanded them, saying, See, you're going to ambush the city from behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. That's the same Hebrew word as in Greek when we just read in Matthew, be ready. It's one of those incredible things that Joshua was told by God to do. The little town, of, not little town, it was a city of Ai had turned evil and God was going to destroy it. And Joshua took the army of Israel 
in all of its strength and power, it was at its height at this point. And he brings most of the army to the front of Ai. And if you were living in Ai and you looked out, you saw this vast army. And God says, just leave them there. So the army of Ai gets all excited and they go out to defeat him. They go out and they go out to confront this army of Israel. Meanwhile, the 300,000 that are in the back behind, they're ready. They're ready. See, and that was a battle that came and they took over the whole city of Ai while the army was out trying to fight in front of the city. The others came in and destroyed it. Another very powerful story is Gideon. <coughs> Gideon was told to get the army ready again for another battle. And the Lord told him, I am with you. I will be with you when all this happens in Joshua chapter 6. An angel comes to him and tells him what he wants. He tells Joshua, you go in the strength of the Lord. Go. Now, Josh, or not Joshua, Gideon, I'm sorry. No, um, I lost myself there, Gideon. Gideon is to go, is to go and take on this army. You know what he said to the Lord? He says, I'm from the weakest tribe, Manasseh, the smallest of all the tribes of Israel. I don't have. The Lord stops him, the angel stops him. You just be ready. The Lord will win this battle. And as the story goes on in chapter 7, it's amazing what happens. Joshua brings over um, 30,000 men to get ready for the battle. You know this story, some of you, from Sunday school. The first thing that happens, he says to them, if any of you are afraid or tremble, you go home. So the first wave goes away. And then he says, come to the water's edge. And some were very thirsty. And they got down and they drank the water by lapping their tongue in the water. Gideon says, send them home. 300 scooped up the water, hand on their sword, and they drank from their hand while they watched. And Gideon's told, they're the ones I want. 300 of those men. They were ready to go. They were ready. And they were watching. If the enemy would have come, those 300 would have been absolutely ready. The others would have had their head buried in the water. Or the others would have been afraid. But there was the 300. You know what's amazing about those 300? Is they were going to take on... Let me get to the scripture here this morning. They were going to take on over 450,000 Midianite soldiers. I think if, my, if I'm correct, that's about 450 to 1. But God says, be ready. Be ready. And they were. They were ready to fight. What about us? How am I bring this to us. How do we operate in this world so we can be ready? Again, I cannot list out ten points for you to get ready. I can't say you need to do this, 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 and this, and this, and get ready. I just need to tell you, be ready. It's not really a complex thing. It's a state of being. It's in your mind. You're to be ready for the Lord's return. It can happen now. It can happen a hundred years from now. But as believers, we're to be ready. What do we be ready with? What, what are we to be ready with? Well, the first thing that I see in that is always on your lips is the gospel. It's always, it should always be on your lips. You should always be engaged with the gospel. Karen has the little kids in Sunday school, and last Sunday I stayed with that class just to see where they were going. And, and these are like, what, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, 
right? Yeah. Maybe some three, five. five six. No. Three, five, and six. Three, five, and six. Karen brought out, I had a crown of thorns, and she told the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Now you can ask those kids. It's been over a week now. They remember some things about that. I made them touch the thorns. Oh, they're sharp. They're sharp. Karen described how Jesus was whipped. Oh, that must have hurt. We're building into the children the gospel. You know. You know those things. You know the crown of thorns. You know the, the whipping. You know the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know the purpose of that was to forgive our sins, to pay the penalty. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's what should be on your heart. I get it. I, Forgive me for saying this, but sometimes I'm really disturbed when sometimes we say, well, I'm just I, I, I'm just building a relationship. I'll tell them about it sometime. I do it. You've done it. But you know what? If Jesus comes now, you didn't tell him. We need to live in such a way that the moment God gives us opportunity, we prepare to speak, or we speak the gospel. Oh. But be on your guard. The enemies are all around you. I'm afraid, Pastor. I'm afraid to share the gospel. That's because Satan's pushing. He's pushing to stop you. He knows it's the answer. scripture that was read be on your guard stand firm you may be flogged in the synagogues as the scriptures say but stand firm with your testimony stand firm with what God has done in your life I've said this I don't know how many times but you know your testimony your personal testimony is one of the most powerful <coughs> weapons you have to talk about Jesus. Oh, people can argue with me all about Scripture. They have all kinds of things they want to argue about. But you know what they can't argue about? They can't argue what Jesus Christ did in my life. Because I know what he's done in my life, and you can't take that away from me. That's how strong your testimony is. But in that being ready... Beware, your faith will be stretched. The scripture that Trisha or Karen read this morning talks about being flogged and talks about the punishments and the attacks. But in Luke chapter 12, listen to this verse. It says, And when they bring you into the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. I believe the Holy Spirit will just give you the right words. Be able to form your testimony. Be able to tell them what God has done. You look at the book of Acts. And whenever one of the disciples or Paul were drugged in front of the authorities, they had the testimony of Jesus Christ to say. And it was there. It was given to them. stretching of your faith. Having your faith stretched in moments like that. I wonder how many of us are not sharing our faith. I know some of you do. But how many of us are not sharing our faith? <coughs> we have all kinds of excuses. We might be scared. We're not sure the person would accept it. He might not like us anymore. They might not like us. You know what? You shouldn't care about those kind. You say, now wait a minute. We should care if they don't like us. Will they like us any better or less when they go to hell? Think about that. 
in 1 Peter chapter 3. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Can I repeat that? Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Do I need to repeat that? I hope by now you got it. Be ready to give a defense for your faith. I was looking at that scripture in Matthew and I began to think about, Lord, am I ready to give an account of my faith? Oh, I can get up and preach. Give me that opportunity, I'll do it. But when I meet the person on the street, am I ready? In um, 1 Timothy, let me, or 2 Timothy, let me read this scripture. But realize that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid, avoid such men. Let me stop there for a minute. I got just about every circumstance that we see in the world around us. Where is mankind today? There it is. Lovers of. And he tells us then. <laughs> but you, you have followed my teaching. Conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch and Ithaca and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of all of them, all the Lord, all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Yet, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of them, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from child you have known of the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This is the book. This is the book that equips us. Okay? But again, it's not like I have to read every page before I'm ready. Okay? Next week, we're going to look at the book. We're going to look at how important is the scripture. And that verse that we just left will come back into our lesson. But many of you from childhood have heard the stories of Noah, Samson, Goliath, and David, and on and on and on. And you know the gospel. I think many of you here could tell me about Jesus' death on the cross, you could tell me about his time in front of all the Romans and the Jewish leaders. You could tell me about his death. You could even tell me why he died. You could tell me about his resurrection. And it's okay to talk about the old, old story. But I'm not the one that needs to hear it. I say that carefully. I love to hear the gospel. But it's those people that are out there, your neighbors, your friends, people you work with, people you go to school with, 
there's many that do not know the gospel. Your faith, your faith is tight communion with God. It's what hooks you to Him. It keeps you with Him. And nothing, we just read that scripture, nothing can sever that. Nothing that the world throws at you can sever that faith and that link you have to God. That's what makes it so precious. That's what makes it so unique. I can share the gospel with the devil himself because my faith is linked to God in such a way that it cannot be severed. Oh, there's all kinds of theories about the end times. I was going to put a whole bunch of slides up and talk to you a little bit about the pre-tribulation and the mid-tribulation, post-tribulation and the all-millennials. Each one has some things to say. Probably most of us here believe the pre-tribulation rapture that Jesus is coming before all the tribulation that the world will see at the end. The seven years of tribulation that are going to be horrible. I, it's no other way to put it. And I like that one. Because I like getting out of here before the tribulation. But there are other verses that talk about how to live in tribulation. So we have to think about that. But it brings me back to the beginning. All those, all those views of scripture have one thing in common that Jesus could come now. Even ones that talk about after tribulation and so on, there's so many verses in scripture that talk about Jesus coming now that if I live in the tribulation, I'll still have to have that link of now. Be ready. I wish I could say that a hundred times to you. Be ready. Live in a state of readiness. Live in a state where Jesus could come when I walk out that door. Wouldn't that be something? I don't know. Maybe I need to preach on when it's appropriate to say amen. <laughs> I was trying to get you to say that, but thank you. You need to say it because if he comes now, you don't need the amen anymore. Okay? Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Be dressed in readiness. Amen. Now it started it. <laughs> But it's so important to live on that edge. When I was in high school, I tried out for gymnastics. <laughs> hey. Amen. I'm sitting, I'm sitting down. You know. And they had the balance beam. You know that beam that's about six, eight inches and it goes about 15 feet? And you're supposed to get up there and do all this dancing stuff on it and turn around and upside down and all that kind of stuff. Uh, many times. <laughs> I, I was trying to I was trying to do it the right way and I remember my coach coming up to me and saying, Lance, just be ready to make it to the other end. And I thought, yeah, that's all I have to do is get to the other end. How I get there, well, it's different, different things you do and all that kind of stuff, but be ready to get there. See, and, and for us and our faith, we're told so many times in Scripture about our little light. The kids sing that little light song, you know, with this little light of mine. Let it shine. Okay? I'm going to correct the way we do that, and maybe you can correct the children. They always talk about hiding it under a bushel, and they go like this, don't they? Uh -uh. You can't hide it under a bushel. And then the next verse goes, blow it out. I tell the kids, move your hand away. It's not going to be blown out. If you have a light for Jesus, it's not under a bushel and it's not going to be blown out. It's going to shine for Jesus. 
That's how we're to live with the light shining. In uh, Luke 12, it says, Be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps alight. And be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those whose servants whom the master shall find on the alert. When he comes, truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even the third and finds them so, blessed are those servants. And be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect it. I try to read some history every time I do a sermon. Just what was going on in Jesus' day? What was some of the things that were happening? Well, the Jewish culture had a father find the bride for the kid. That has always scared me. Um, but that was the way the culture was. And the father would meet with other fathers and they would choose a bride for their son. <clears throat> but then the culture had a unique thing. The father would go to his son and say, this woman is going to be your bride. But here's what you must do first. Son, you must go and build a house for you and your bride. In fact, in the Old Testament, it even talks about some of that. It says that the son was not to serve in the army. He was not to serve in any temple position. He was to work on his house to get it ready for his bride. Then, in the Jewish culture, when the house was finished, wasn't the son's job to turn around and go get his bride. The father said to the son, now we will go get our bride, your bride. And the two of them would go off and get the bride and bring him back to the house. If you read the scriptures over and over again, Jesus says, I don't know the hour, but I'm preparing a mansion for you and me. And God will say soon, Son, it's done. Come. If my little Michael were here, he, he has this ability to, when you go visit him at the house, he goes, come, Papa, come. We're going to go play. Come. No matter what I'm doing, I have to come. But see, there's God. He comes to his son and he says, now, come. We're going to get our bride. When that moment happens, the universe will shake. The very foundations of the world will shake. And Jesus will descend and he will come to get his bride. Come on. That's us. Amen. Now's the time to say it. Amen. Amen. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, Sometimes it's just a little slow. But... <laughs> How ready are you? You can't get ready. I can't send you home to get ready. You've got to be ready. It could end like now. Come, bride. Come. It's time to go to your mansion. It's time to be when you think of all that and you think of the way in which John 14 talks about the mansions being built and put together and, you know, we, I used to have a guy that on the record, or probably the kids don't know what a record is, it's a little round disc that you put on this thing and it spins and it plays music. But anyway, this little record that I had, it talked about how God created the world in seven days. 
And is the world beautiful? Sure, there's gorgeous things in this world. But according to Jesus, he's been working on the mansion for 2,000 years. Since when he was here on earth, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. So for over 2,000 years, he's been preparing our mansion. You think the world's beautiful? Heaven's going to be far beyond that. Amen. Amen. In discussion with some of you just the other day about what's it going to be like? Am I going to know so and so in heaven? I don't have all the answers for that, but I know one thing. It's going to be so spectacular that it's going to be beyond what I can even comprehend right now. Amen. Yeah, it is. The Bible uses golden streets and pearly gates and mansions of gold, and, and, and you know what? Our language doesn't have the words to portray heaven. Whatever the language that Adam and Eve spoke when they communicated with God just by thoughts and all that before the fall, that language, whatever that was, is how we're going to experience God. And the thrill and the worship and the excitement and the beauty will be beyond our words. So what does it look like to be ready here on this earth? There should be a joy that stirs. There should be amens. There should be times where all of a sudden I, I'm caught up with the fact that Jesus is good coming now. It's that exciting. Be ready with the gospel message. Be ready to share and snatch one from the fire. Be ready to share that gospel now, not wait 30 years to establish some sort of relationship. When I speak the gospel from this pulpit, okay, it may fall on some deaf ears, but it may fall on ears that are open. When you share your faith with someone, when you tell them what God has done in your life, yes, some will laugh. They did to Noah. But some will be touched by the Spirit of God. And imagine that their life will be changed. There's one young man in our life we called him Ponytail Mike. When I watched his life get changed, when the gospel touched him, he was part of the fan club of the Grateful Dead, if you know anything about the Grateful Dead. He followed them all around the country, making sandals so people could wear them at the concerts. But when his life changed, oh my gosh, the gospel has such power. He's a preacher today. This blows my mind. That's what can happen when you share the gospel. Be ready to have your faith stretched, as I said. Your faith will be stretched. You will be put on the edge. Maybe even drawn up for persecution. But be encouraged, Thessalonians says. Encourage one another with the fact that he's coming. I want you to leave encouraged today that Jesus is coming now. Don't let me repeat this sermon again in seven years. I hope we're not here. I pulled this one out of my file because I wanted to share it on the cruise, but I said, you know what? I need to repair, re repeat this sermon here at Grace and Truth. You need to know that he's coming now. I can't give you all the prophecies about Israel and Hamas and Gaza and all the rebuilding of Israel. That's all there in Scripture. You're welcome to look at it, but I want you to live like he's coming now. Because I can guarantee you that when Jesus and God get together and say it's time to get the bride, it don't matter what prophecies are out there, because he's coming. 
prophecies will be answered in the way in which God wanted them to be answered. Israel will do whatever God wanted them to do, and how that will all work out, I don't know. But I do know this, he's coming. Be ready. He's coming now. Lord, we are awake. Lord, I want to live on the edge. And before I open my eyes from this prayer, I could be in heaven. Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. We wait. Father, and we know our faith can be stretched and challenged and pushed to the limit, possibly even the giving of our earthly life. But oh, Lord, to walk into your kingdom, to come into your presence, nothing will be greater. Thank you, Father, for this sermon this morning, what it means to me and what it means to each one that's here. Come quickly. Amen. Let's all stand to close. <coughs>
some might come forward. We're going to just send them off with prayer. They may or may not be here another week, but we'll see and we'll see what God has in store for them. Lord, thank you for Marlon and Sambath and their ministry in Cambodia. Lord, I pray that you would just anoint them with your love. Father, may they proclaim that you're coming now. Father, may people in that country see and hear your salvation. Father, bless them as they go. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.